Well, good morning, friends. Mark Holmes here, and as always, I want to thank you guys for watching, commenting, subscribing, and being part of the Joe Boo Sports Report. Without you guys, as well as you ladies, you know that this literally does not work. Uh, today, today, guys, I've got something really, really special here. Um, I, I, I've been looking forward to this all week, and it's just been waiting till this morning to actually get here and actually do this. Um, from time to time, I'm truly blessed to actually have some great people to talk to. And this morning, we are actually going to be talking to Terrence Parsons, uh, better like, I'm sorry, liking to be called Parsons, correct? Yes. <laughs> Welcome to the Joe Boo Sports Report. How are you doing this morning? I'm doing good. No complaints. How are you? I am fantastic, man. Um, I'm so excited about having your son and actually meeting you as well. And first, let me say thank you for your service because you're much like me. You don't sleep a whole lot and you are into a whole lot of things. And you were originally in the Army, correct? Yes. And um, I know that you coach basketball and uh, you coach volleyball and all kinds yeah. of stuff. Um, I actually wanted to ask you about the the Parsons Foundation because I know that in 2020 you were going to be doing college tours with kids and things, and that was canceled. Uh, how is the foundation and stuff going? Well, right now, you know, everything is, is slow because, you know, with the pandemic, a lot of stuff has changed the way colleges do things and everything. So... I'm kind of like at a standstill right now. Mm -hmm. Let's do some local things, you know, feeding the kids and everything like that. Well, that's great because, you know, um, I did work with Namdi years ago, um, Namdi Asmawa, and he did college tours and things, and it really changes and shapes people's views. A lot of times you have kids that are used to being in a, you know, five-mile radius and never see anything else in the world. <laughs> And you guys actually going through and doing that is actually life changing to let people expire to other things. So, um, to me, I believe if you don't know where you've come from, you don't know where you're going. And from the things that I've learned about you and Micah uh, growing up, I can definitely see where he gets his tenacity. Um, when did you know that Micah was going to be the guy? I mean, did he ever talk about wanting to be a pro football player or, Dad, I'm going to be that pro football player? Yeah, actually, it's funny you ask that. So he was like five years old. We was watching football, and he was like, yeah, I got about 18 more years. I'm going to the NFL. And I was like, yeah, okay. This sounds good, you know, but I took it as a joke. But he was always kind of big, so mm -hmm. I took him over to um, the late Charles Chisholm's house. He was the – um. He ran the Harrisburg Packers organization. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, my son wants to play football. He was like, well, bring him by since he's not old enough. Let me check him out. Mm -hmm. So he go over there. We're on his porch. He was like, can you do some push-ups? He was like, yeah, you know, I got like 15 push-ups. Mm -hmm. Then he stood up and Coach Is had these big hands. And he like gave him a mm -hmm. chest shot. <laughs> Michael took like a step back and came forward. He said, oh, yeah. You can sign him up. Don't worry about it. <laughs> I mean, I knew he could do the push-ups because that was like part of punishments growing up. Mm -hmm. You know, getting the front lean and rest or you do push-ups for pizza. Oh, wow. Okay. So you knew from that, that point on. Um, I heard something. See, I heard something that reminded me of Charles Haley. Um, Charles Haley was this ultra-competitive guy. When we saw um, Hard Knock seeing Micah playing chess and seeing how – um, laser focus he was. Is he one of those I've got to win at everything kind of mentalities? Yes. And well, that yeah, because definitely that was Charles. It didn't matter if it was spades or if it was football, even in practice. And literally in practice, he ended up making a guy a cheerleader. Was he that same style as far as when in practice that, you know, he's going full tilt? You know, well, practice, at, at the Pro Bowl, he wanted to go all out. I could see that he was jumping at the bit. Oh, yeah. At practice, growing up, nah, he he would, he wouldn't go hard at practice. He would save it for game day. Mm -hmm. And, you know, coaches didn't understand that. But when they asked him, they said, we need you to go harder at practice. And then hit one of the running backs kind of hard. And it was like, oh, okay, let's just go have speed and chill. Because, like I said, he's a competitor. So when they came to game day, he's going to turn up. But practice, he just – go through the motions, 
I know what you need me to do. So I'm a game day. Yes. This is what I'm gonna give you. Well, he definitely has that tenacity. And so for me personally, I always like to try and find out how they end up getting this uh, tenacity and stuff. But how has uh, your son being drafted changed your life? I mean, it hasn't really changed my life. I meet a lot of people now. You know, a lot of people want to talk to me or they treat me like I'm a celebrity. But I'll be trying to get them to understand, listen, that's my son, you know. I'm just here for the games, you know. <laughs> I'm not looking for a whole lot of woo wow, woo wow. I mean, it's fun, but sometimes it's cool, but sometimes it get a little bit annoying, you know. So I can't imagine what he goes through. Are you still in awe of meeting Dak Prescott? Actually, I didn't get a chance to meet him yet. Yeah. Um, oh, just man. Zeke. I got to meet Zeke, and I hang out with Zeke's dad, you know, at the games. Okay. Well, uh, apparently I, I found out that your daughter also is a pro basketball player. Is that correct? Well, she played overseas for a couple of years, but now she's back here teaching and um, coaching down at Penn State York. Mm -hmm. Did you ever push your son into playing football? Was football or sports important as far as, you know, as a, as a father? Were you one of those ones that, you know, my boy is going to be playing football and going to be the star? Well, no, um, he wanted to play football. My goal, my thing was, you know, I just wanted my kids to be involved. So at one point when I was married, I was going through, you know, finances. And I was like, we're not going to be to send our kids to college. I said, it's going to cost us about a half million dollars to send all three of our kids to school. I said, so between academic and sports, we're going to make this happen. So I said my kids now, I said, listen, I know y'all play sports. They're going to play sports year round. And then when you get to like seventh grade, pick one sport and that's going to be the focus. Mm -hmm. I said, help me to help you because we don't got that kind of money and we're not going to get it right now. So between academics and athletics, we can make it happen. Um, seventh grade, um, you had told me that uh, you actually held Micah back. And see, I, I think that that might have been a changing point for the way he views everything in life. Am I correct on that? And, yes. And you know, why you ended up holding him back? Yeah, so six grade, I wanted to hold him back, you know. Everybody was against me. No, don't do that. Don't do that. I said, well, you know, he's pretty good. So if you don't have no grades, he's not going to go nowhere. So he has to develop a habit now. You can't wait till you get to high school and try to develop it. It might be too late. So let him slide through sixth grade. The seventh grade, these, you know, I said, oh, no, you're not understanding. So that year, he got held back, and he couldn't play no football. So that was a rough year for him. Mm -hmm. And how did he take it? I mean, did he take it and start working harder, turning around, and getting the grade? Yeah, academically, he started getting better. But that year, he couldn't play no football. He, he didn't really like that too much Oh, because yeah, okay. I know he liked football. So – I took that away. Wow. Okay. You know, every parent, okay, has a story about their kids. For me, I remember my daughter and my son out in the backyard. They're playing. They're digging around in the dirt. And I remember my daughter saying, Dad, Michael keeps taking my dirt. And I kind of went off and like, Michael, why are you taking uh, all the dirt from your sister and stuff? And then I sat there. I looked around. And I realized it's like there's dirt everywhere. What are y'all fighting over? Did you ever have one of those moments where you looked at your son and kind of like, what is wrong with you? Yeah, uh, you know, he's just a kid, you know. Just he likes to have fun. You know, he's he's a big kid. Uh huh. You know, so I mean eventually he had to wake up, you know, and as he got older and we started traveling and he started saying like, Oh, kids is graduating early, oh kids is on the honor roll. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, I'm trying he I knew athletically he was there, so mm -hmm. he had to get it academically. So it definitely was a dramatic change from seventh grade up until he graduated. Well, you've been a lifetime cowboy fan, right? Yes. How did that work out being in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania? I mean, because you're close to kind of Eagle territory and kind of fringing on Steelers as well. So how did in the world did you gravitate towards the Cowboys? <laughs> oh, man, it was a funny <laughs> story. Uh oh, here we go. You know, Growing up, we always used to play Cowboys and Indians. Uh -huh. The Cowboys had the guns, so I feel like they would always win, so I was a Cowboy fan. <laughs> okay, all right. Never <laughs> never thought about being an Eagle fan? Nah. No, nah, never even crossed your mind. 
That's a smart no. man there. Okay, and so, you know, did you have any worries about Micah going to the NFL, you know, with three years of college and then sitting out that year? No, not no worries. You know, like, it was a rough year for me because that was a – besides seventh grade, that was the last time I didn't get to see my son play football. Mm -hmm. So me being a football fan and watching him play all them years, you know, when he opted to set out, like, people were mad. But, like, for me, that was rough because – that was a year I really had nothing to do, but he had to do was best for him and his son. Mm -hmm. You know, he wanted to play. Like, a lot of people was upset with him. But like I said, you understand the pandemic mm -hmm. caused that change. And then the Big Ten wasn't sure they was going to play football. It was going back and forth, back and forth. So then the young man from uh, Virginia Tech, I think he was the first one to opt out mm -hmm. through the pandemic. And then my son said, Dad, I think I'm going to sit out. I said, hey, you know, we could talk about it, but if that's your decision, you know, you want to get ready to prepare for the draft. My thing is, you still going to school? Hey, go for it. But it has to be your decision. Mm -hmm. So we got together, he opted out, did the video and everything. And then like two, maybe three weeks later, the Big Ten said they have a season. So now my son's like, man, I think I want to play. At the time, I was heading out to California anyway. Cause that's where he was living, that training. Mm -hmm. And I was like, man. And I was all for it, for real, because you're thinking about the dick buckets in college, you know, playing another year. I'm, I'm kind of hyped. But then the NFL, people start getting hurt. Mm -hmm. And I was like, yeah, you kind of made your decision already, son. I don't think we should backtrack. He said, but I want to, I said, you're looking at individual goals. Uh, you made your decision already. You mm -hmm. played on it. You came up with a decision. You came right to California. You're training. Mm -hmm. It's not you're doing good because now you're actually on your own. You make your rules. If you decide to go back, now you're back in college. You got the college rules and everything. So yeah. do you want to go from – you're independent right now for the most part. Do you want to let that go to go back? I don't think so. And his mom's like, yeah, let's go in and stay where you at. You're set up. You're good. You prayed about it. You're in the right position now. Just keep going forward. I mean, you know, Penn State, they laid out a nice thing. You know, if he came back, it was great. But the big picture, you know, I know he wants to go to the league. He's on pace to graduate. He's going to be okay. Mm -hmm. Now, did I think he was going to go in the first round? Nah. Because, you know, he only had two years of football and he – Mm -hmm. You know, I was like, I don't know. But then the talk kept going, and I knew the draft was going to be it. Mm -hmm. I said, if he runs a 4-3, he's locked in. Yeah. He's locked in. I knew that. And, you know, his nickname was the water boy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Younger, like Bobby Boucher. Yeah. His very first year, he would tackle everybody. His teammates, the other players. Like, we would have to let him go get him off the field because he just wanted to play. Mm -hmm. But – the water boy, that came from his first game down in Carlisle. It was raining heavy. He was a running back, and he went up like a 35-yard run. He got tackled in the mud, and he just hopped up and ran back to the huddle. And I said, oh, we got a good one. You know, little kids at that age, they don't like getting wet and being all muddy. Not him. He, it didn't even bother. He just jumped up, went back to the huddle. I said, oh, we got a good one here. Oh, my this, this didn't even bother me. And then that just stuck with him. So when he decided that he was going to go ahead and go pro that third year, did you guys discuss it? Or was there you know, any trepidation or anything on that? I mean, he had his pros and cons, but we just want him to know at the end of the day, you're going to support your decision because mm -hmm. this is your life. You know what I mean? My main goal at this point is, are you still on pace to graduate? Mm -hmm. He's like, yes, in December. That's all that matters to me. So getting that degree was more important than him getting to the NFL? Yeah, because nothing's guaranteed. Mm -hmm. But you get that degree, that's guaranteed, paper in hand. Mm -hmm. You know, you're part of a great alumni base, you know. The work field, having a job should be good for you. You know what I mean? So once you got that in hand, whatever the NFL does or doesn't do, you got that degree to fall back on. Amen. See, I can see you definitely instilled a lot of, of what Micah Parsons definitely is. 
So take me, and I don't want to take up too much of your time and things. Oh, we're good. We're good? Okay. Take me to draft night. So, you you know, you weren't sure where he was going to go. Did you have any thought that it would be the Dallas Cowboys? No, but true story. So the same weekend I went up to California, uh-huh. we were talking. He said, well, Dad, you know I'm be a Cowboy. I said, <laughs> oh, I love this now. Okay. I said, man, go ahead. You're always playing games. He's no think about it, Dad. I graduated from Harrisburg, mm-hmm. where you graduated from, because he had transferred schools yeah. middle of his junior year. He said, I went to Penn State, your favorite college team. Right. <laughs> oh, boy. It, okay. It was written, I'm going to be a Cowboy. I said, okay, if you say so. So at the draft, I'm looking at where it's at. I'm looking at like, yeah. Because now I'm looking at, after the combine, after he ran the 439, I said, oh, he's not going to fall that far. Because, you know, I'm from, I'm from the area where you pick the best available player. Mm-hmm. The Cowboys sitting at 12. No, they're sitting at 10. Mm-hmm. I'm not taking away nothing from nobody. Mm-hmm. If you're taking the best available player, yeah. There's not nine guys better than Michael Parsons in the draft. So by the looks of it, <laughs> you he, can't argue that. <laughs> he's not gonna go to the he's not gonna go to the Cowboys. But he made a mark after the cotton bowl. He said, Hey, I want to start my NFL career where my college career ended. Mm-hmm. And I was in Dallas. Wow. So you know, when he says you can bet on me being in the Super Bowl. Yeah. Okay. I'm taking that. I like hearing that. I'm not going to say what year is going to happen for him because he's always trying to do it the right way. You You know, always been humble, just playing with the talents he was blessed with. Mm -hmm. And now that he's learning the little things, it just makes him even better. Like he was already blessed, you know, with natural stuff. Like we wasn't in the backyard. Handing the ball off, you know, working in the dirt. We just signed him up and let him play. Wow. Okay. So he's been playing off natural ability for most of his life, but now getting to learn hand movement and placement, feet working, really learning that, that makes him a dangerous player now. So that night, that night, it's the draft. You're believing that he's definitely, you know, a top 20 pick easily. You you believe he's the best player out there. The statistics, you know, to me, he's generational talent. Um, from what he did. But when they called him for the Dallas Cowboys, how did you feel? Uh, first, it was the phone call. Uh-huh. So, hold on. First, let's, let's go rewind back. So, he's in his Dallas blue. I'm in my gray. Mm-hmm. I got my Dallas mask in my pocket just uh-huh. in case. <laughs> so, with the 10th pick, hope the Cowboys make a trade. Oh, I'm losing my mind now. Oh, wow. I answer myself, I'm a Cowboy fan. But my son wants to be here. If he's there at 10 and they don't take him, I'll be finding me a new team. Oh, wow. Okay. So when they made that trade, I was like, wow. Like, ah, I, I was on live. I think I might have cussed and everything. I, I, was, <laughs> I, was, I was distraught. I was like, this is crazy. And then they trade with the Eagles. So I'm thinking, man, I don't even like the Eagles. What the Eagles take? I said, oh, then I got people texting my phone talking about, yeah, Parks, we got this Eagle jersey waiting for you when you get home. I'm just like, no. You just bad now. Man, this ain't even funny no more. I'm not even feeling this. But then when the Eagles didn't draft him, I said, hold on. He might be a cowboy because I know the Giants don't want him. They made it clear they Mm -hmm. don't want to be in a position to take the best available player. Mm -hmm. So once they traded, the phone rang. I said, oh, was that Jerry? Because at 10, we thought the phone rang because it was a phone in the draft in the green room. But I guess we were just mentally thinking the phone was ringing. The phone didn't ring. Then when the Giants made that trade, that's when Jerry called. And it was like, we looking at he's all – and he was like, thank you, Jay. Thank you, Jay. So it was funny because I'm live with everything. Mm-hmm. So everybody who was on my live, and my lives be okay, but today my live was like 900 people strong. Mm-hmm. Everybody was watching. I said, oh, man, everybody watching. So 
part of the country knew he's going to be a cowboy before the announcement was actually made. So some people was mad. They turned the t- they turned the live off because they knew it was getting drafted before it was announced on TV. Mm-hmm. So we already celebrated. Still was like, okay. Let's calm down. So now let's go watch it. So the lady, she's just talking and talking. We like, come on, we just say his name. We already know. You're doing too much. Just say his name. And then they oh, said his name. We jumped up and down. Then he walked out. And the best part about it was when he jumped in the commissioner's arms. Because for me, mm-hmm. I felt like he was looking at his godfather. Because his godfather coached him at the Packer level. Mm-hmm. And he had told me when Mike was about six or maybe seven, he said, yeah, he's going to the league. I said, why you say that? He said, I've seen a lot of players. Mm-hmm. He said, what he got right now is unteachable. You just got to be the controller. And I was mm-hmm. like, oh, okay. So when he jumped in his arms, I felt like he was jumping in the Coach Ham's arms. He told the commercial, you ready? He said, yeah, and jumped in his arm. I thought that was that little kid jumping into his arms. Mm-hmm. That's what I took from it. Wow, that must have been a magical night. So you've just been on this whole ride through there uh, with your son being a cowboy, you know, your team, and seeing him be as successful as, as he is. I mean, he's got to be a lock for rookie of the year, which is amazing. Um, how, you know, hearing how disappointed that he is about the season, um, you know, I know he's probably excited about what he did and contributed. You hear him, he's becoming – I would say the leader on that defense already in his first year. Would I be wrong on that? Well, he's a um, he's a competitor. Mm-hmm. So, if you recall back to the uh, the preseason game when um, I think Vander said, "You don't got to make all the plays." Yes, I do. Like that's it. He's trying to make every play if he can. Mm-hmm. That's just his mo. So, I just feel like. When he plays and the level he plays at, I think people around him are going to play better or want to play better because you're not going to want to just be outshined by somebody. So that's going to make you step your game up. And, like, a lot of people's game did elevate this year around him. You know, our defense made a dramatic turnaround. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, it may not show in the win-loss column, but you look at our defensive ranks and what we did as far as turnovers and everything else. It was a great defensive year. Oh, without you a know. doubt. To go from 29th in scoring defense to 7th, uh, uh, the amount of sacks that we ended up picking up, the turnovers. The turnovers, I would say, is a direct cause of what Michael was doing off the edge. Um, it, he revealed that he actually hyperextended his knee in uh, training camp in the preseason, uh, or excuse me, in practice against the Rams. Um Nobody knew about that. The fact that he ended up hyper stunning his knee, you would have think that would have stunted uh, his development and stuff, but it seemed like he came out of the box just ready to rock and roll. Oh, yeah, you know, you – if you if you know, you just can't sit him. Like, for him not to play, he had to be in a wheelchair or in somebody's hospital. He's, he's going to play. Mm-hmm. Even in that Niner game where they hit helmets and everybody was worried, Mm-hmm. Whether he had a small – he was going to do his best to pass every little test to get back out there on that field. Yeah, I can believe that. Uh, and, and you can see that. I, I guarantee that if he could play a game tomorrow, he'd be ready to play. I, I, I imagine he's already working out and getting stronger for next year right now. I, I can't see him. He, he's got to be a gym rat, as, as I like to term it. Somebody that just wants to do – just, just grew, physically working he, out. Yeah, he grew, he grew into that. Mm-hmm. He grew into that because that wasn't always – that was a he just and like I I didn't realize how good he was really really until we got to college because I just felt like in high school at six three two thirty you're supposed to do what you're doing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, high school you're supposed to do that. If he wasn't yeah. doing it, it's a problem. So that really didn't amaze me too much, you know. And then we was going to these five star camps. And he was dominating. I'm saying to myself, hmm, is he really that good, or is some of these kids get to these camps because of who they know who they play for. Mm-hmm. You see what I'm saying? So, like, yeah. for example, if Michael, if Michael make a call and say, hey, I got three guys, they ready. Mm-hmm. Off his word, these three guys are going to get to go to that camp. Yeah. Now, are they really fire stars? But if he if he's going to vouch for them, they're going to give him an opportunity. Now, he's just like, I take that opportunity and run with it. 
And I think that's how most of these camps be. Mm-hmm. It'd be if it's 200 kids, maybe a hundred or maybe you're legit five stars. The other hundred, three, four, but they know some people. Yeah. So they got the invite. So you gotta cause I used to go, I'd be like, I don't know. Is but, Michael Lee that good? Or but that 2018 class was special though. Mm-hmm. Like I told people in high school, I said the class of 2018, that's gonna be the best class of college football. <laughs> In the last 25 years. And if you look at it, if you look at last year's draft, I believe 80% of that first round were all 2018 kids. Yeah, definitely could be. You know, I, I don't know Micah personally or anything like that, but from what I've seen on him, uh, the greatest compliment I can make about him is, is having played football with Charles Haley at JMU. He is the player the Dallas Cowboys have been waiting on. Now, he's not Charles Haley with the crazy, because like I said, I, I can tell you some stories about Charles, but I'm not going to go into it. But when I, I look at him, and I like to call him a dog, somebody that's in there, that's in your face, that ends up rallying and getting people behind. To me, the Dallas Cowboys have been missing that guy that can really rally the troops and is out there that is a game changer. Um, when I see him play on the field, I felt like this season – we haven't seen somebody playing like that since Lawrence Taylor. Um, your thoughts on that? Would you agree with that? Oh. Um, he's a great addition. Um, I won't put him in the same um, category as Lawrence Taylor. You know, mm-hmm. we only got one year in. I mean, the, the possibilities are endless. And, you know, and like you said, I just want to be Michael Parsons, you know. I just want to play my best and bring my best. I want to be a legend. So, you know, he don't – he doesn't get into that, I'm like this guy, I'm like this guy. Mm-hmm. Michael Parsons, I just, I'm, I'm playing football, and he just loves the game. Like, if they told him next year, hey, we need you at safety, mm-hmm. he'll be one of the best safeties in the league. He's going to learn, he's going to ask questions. Like, he just wants to play football. If they say, hey – can you run two fullback plays? Oh, my God, I've been waiting for this. Yeah, come on, let's go. Like, as long as he's on that field, he's excited. You know, I, I'm surprised that somebody hasn't done, like, a Bo Nose commercial. Remember the Bo Jackson commercial oh, yeah, back in the yeah, day? Yeah, yeah. Because literally seeing him playing, of course, linebacker and then going through and playing defensive end, seeing him back in there, you know, past defenses and all that, it's kind of like, you know, what, what do you need me to do, coach? You know, I wouldn't be surprised if you ended up having to play a couple of snaps at quarterback and things. Um does he have a preference? I know he's the kind of guy that, you know, if I'm playing uh, part-time edge rusher, I'm okay playing middle linebacker. But does he have a preference in playing? Does he like being on the edge more? Does he like being in that middle linebacker? For me, I think he's more effective on that edge. A lot of people will say, you know, he doesn't have the weight and the size. But, you know, Charles is about 250 and about 6'3", 6'4". Um, to me, defensive ends, it's now about speed more so than size. He likes the linebacker position, but I'll tell you, like I tell anybody else, mm-hmm. if you want to maximize him, mm-hmm. let him stay on the edge. I have to agree with that 100%. I mean, from little league to middle school to high school, like him on the edge is almost like Dion was at corner. Mm-hmm. Just mm-hmm. there on one side of the field. You know? Like I said, when he made that call to me and said, yeah, man, Tank got hurt and moved me to DN, I was excited. (laughs) I'll be honest. I was like, oh, man, I'm not sure, you know, being a rookie, you know, just coming out and having the the problem with being a rookie is, you know, you're the big fish in a little pond. Now you go to the pros, everything is faster, and you're now playing against all big fish. And to go from playing – middle linebacker, now i got to play edge? And it's like, how, you're going to learn all of this this quick? To see him make that transition was like, wow. It, it was just amazing to watch. Well, see, that's the thing. It really wasn't a transition. you got to understand, he played defensive end from mm-hmm. age 6 to age 18. Mm-hmm. He played the end. only thing he might not knew was the, really the hand movements. But to come off the edge, to, you know, the move, he's been doing that. Mm-hmm. And then learning with the Marcus and them, they really teach them more hand movements and everything. Mm-hmm. I said, oh, and like he said in that one interview, yeah, he had a lot of work today, didn't he? Yeah, because, again, when you bring in that speed every play, 
Mm-hmm. That wear them tackles out. Oh, without a doubt. Yeah. And see, I think that's what the Cowboys need to do with him. They honestly need to get him on that edge, you know, at least 25, 30 plays a game. So if you think if you if he gets them going out and he swings back in, they're not moving back in that quick. Mm -mm. And then it came to a point where they had to bring the tight end over or even have the running back help. So now you got two or three guys worried about one person. That frees up somebody over there. They got to win the one on one battle. Yeah, there you go. Well, you know, I've, I've been on here for quite a bit, and I know you're at work and things, and I appreciate it. Can you tell me more about your live stream before we get out of here and where we can find it and when you're on? Well, TPTV, I usually go on when I'm at events. Mm-hmm. You know, whether especially when I'm in Dallas, you know, with the Star Status Club or games, I go TP live. Usually whenever I'm out at an event or something, I usually go live to try to – either it's my event or I'm promoting somebody else's event, you know, Try to get people to come out and everything. I don't have a, a, a YouTube, everything like you do. That's that's in the works. Okay. You know, TPTV, you know, um, a young lady named Michelle Green here in Harrisburg. Mm-hmm. We're going to get together. She's going to sit down and we're going to work and try to see what we want to talk about. You know, it'd be sports, but sometimes maybe everyday life, you know. Like right now, mental health is big. So, oh, yeah. you know, I'm really trying to look into that and learn more because – I didn't realize how big it was, you know, until I started experiencing some things and seeing some things. I'm like, man, yeah, mental health ain't no joke. So, Mm -hmm. you know, seeking the help and and be willing to go talk to somebody, you know, that's big. And and our younger kids need it more than ever now. You know, you know, growing up, you know, kind of was taught, you don't go sit and talk with nobody. Yeah. But man, you don't need that. Nah, you need that. You really do. You need to be going somewhere to, to openly express yourself and get some direct dialogue and then do some homework on yourself. So that's been that's been good for me over the past year. You know what I mean? So you just never know what nobody's going through. So mm-hmm. being able to talk, even this experience right here, like I could have never prepared for this unless I had somebody to go through it. Mm-hmm. You know, like I was at the mall in Minnesota, and someone said, Oh my god. Your mic is there. I'm like, oh, whoa, okay. <laughs> you know, yeah, yeah it kind of caught me off guard. Like, and I'm not a celebrity, I'm, you know what I mean? But in other people's eyes, I am somebody more than just Mike's dad. I'm just mm-hmm. like, okay, you know, I don't know. You know, I'm kind of laid back, you know, chill. This one, I just want to be the quiet person in the room, have mm-hmm. some fun. But ah, uh, other people think differently. So I'm trying to build myself up to accept it more. Mm-hmm. You know, when you don't know nobody, they run up on you real quick. You know, I was like, oh, okay. You just never know what might can happen. Yeah, but it it's, definitely it's, it's, is different. <laughs> it was, definitely was an experience this year, though. Met some really nice people, though. Mm-hmm. Connected with some good people. So, you know, it has its ups and its downs, you know. You never know who you might be meeting. Mm-hmm. So instead of, you know, me Sweetie. turn away and not Sweetie. being, you know, receptive of it, you know what I mean? I could miss out on something. So, mm-hmm. like I said, it's definitely different, and I'm learning daily. Well, definitely, you know, you have a wealth of knowledge and experiences that are great to be be shared, and uh, the work that you're doing in the community with the Parsons Foundation and looking out for the next generation, and all of the things you instilled in your son are incredible, and I hope you do do that YouTube channel. If there's anything I can do to help out with that situation, I would love to to uh, help out and share at least a few things that I've learned. I'm still just scratching the surface of all this, but I truly appreciate you being here. Hope that you have a wonderful day and people. Thanks for tuning in. And uh, hopefully your son is correct that he is going to be in that Super Bowl, bringing home that Lombardi trophy. And I know you couldn't be any more proud of your son. Yes. Yes. I'm very proud of him. And I'm happy for him because he's living his dream and I'm able to see him live his dream. All right. I appreciate that. And with that being said, we're done with this.